Sophie, aloha Friday, and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Today, we have a very special guest uh, who is also a friend and a big dreamer that I really admire. His name is Jeff Kim, and he's an organizer and also the co-chair of the Sierra Club Hawaii Energy Committee. And uh, we're going to start this program by talking about the American dream. Uh, this is a term that at one point or another everybody have heard, but what does it really mean? Are we living the American dream that was started uh, and coined uh, in the uh, early 30s, 1930s? Uh, are we living a life that's better than our grandparents and our parents? What kind of legacy and foundation are we leaving behind for our offsprings? Well, on that note, let's uh, jump right in and welcome uh, Jeff to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for having me, Je uh, for, for being in the show sure. and uh, uh, for granting this time with us uh, no and worries. our viewers. So do you mind telling a little bit about yourself? Uh, where do you come from and how did you end up in Hawaii? Oh, okay, sure. Um, I originally came from Chicago, uh, but lived a lot of places in the, in the mainland. And uh, how I came to Chicago, I mean, came to Hawaii, um, Pretty long story, but the short version is basically I, I moved here for family. Uh, my sister's been here for uh, you know several years already, and uh, um, basically just uh, you know kind of the, all of us sort of grew up apart growing up. Um, uh, like really, the story on that is like I went to boarding school starting 13, and my sister 15. So you know we basically just since then have not all lived together and. Uh, around when my sister was getting married, uh, two, three years ago, we had an opportunity to all move here. Like everybody was in the right position at the time to, you know, go to one place. And only person who had didn't have to, or had to stay in one place, was my sister because of her her uh, work here. So mm -hmm. that's how I ended up here. Yeah. So you've been here in Hawaii for three years now, mm -hmm. and tell me about your experiences you know what did you think Hawaii was gonna be like before you moved in here because we all have this aloha you know yeah. cultural like perspective that is sold you know for the rest of the world in this very peaceful abundant uh, place yeah. and then there's reality where paradise is not always quite easy um, so what was your perspective then and now <laughs> Oh, that's a good question, yeah. Um, I honestly didn't have a lot of thoughts coming in, you know, already. Um, certainly, yeah, like just the stereotypes of, oh, everything's, you know, beautiful sandy beaches and, and whatever. Um, and, yeah, and the, and the culture of Aloha. But, yeah, didn't really have a lot of expectations otherwise. Um, and, and also, you know, without sounding, you know, disrespectful, like actually, like I wasn't really that excited to come here because this was really like about family about why I came because mm -hmm. um, I love Chicago you know mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and I love winter actually which I'm like the one percent of the human population that actually does and I love bitter Chicago winters yeah um, that minus 30 wind chill exactly <laughs> yeah to during the yeah, winter months salivating now mm. you know and, uh, <laughs> um, and, so, and uh, I'm, I've never been a like a paradise chaser you know and like um, so given all that, you know, I didn't really have a lot of thoughts. But now that I've been here, uh, well, for one, you know, I was very, you know, soon after getting here, I was really impressed, you know, and just had so much respect for the fact that I found that, um, yeah, like that, that aloha really was alive, you know, and people really did practice this, you know, this compassion and, and, and just the, I mean, this is by far the friendliest place I've ever lived. And I've lived, you know, all across the country, you know, urban, rural, suburban. And yeah, it's absolutely the friendliest place I've lived and the most community oriented. Um, and that especially, you know, is, you know, really amazing to me given that, like, you know, we live in one of the, Honolulu at least is one of the top three most expensive cities, you know, to live in. But unlike New York and San Francisco, those other two, you know, the, the kind of jobs that we have and the kind of uh, income that you can make here is is not quite up to par, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and yeah, and just just the fact that people have to work so hard, you have so much economic struggle, yet still are able to maintain that, you know, that um, yeah, that that community spirit and that and that compassion towards one another, and that people d still you know really take their time here, you know, mm -hmm. almost it's like I would almost expect just on paper, given the economic struggle and 
uh, the lack of opportunities in relation to somewhere like New York, that people would be like really at each other's throats, you know, super rat race mentality, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just so amazing to me, yeah, that, that, that it's still, you know, we're still able to be one of the friendliest places that I've ever lived. You know? Very true. So, Helen Organizer, yeah. uh, how do you see that transition from coming from Chicago to Hawaii and do organizing work here in Hawaii? What are you finding? Oh, just kind of like the differences between Chicago and here? Yes. In terms of like organizing and mm -hmm. so forth? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think, you know, there's definitely pros and cons uh, of both places, you know, in terms of the scenes. Um, uh, certainly, like, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I definitely have to say that, like, Chicago has, I think, a much more, um, you know, robust structure in terms of, and, and just access to resources for people who want to get involved. Um, but, you know, something that certainly Hawaii has that I think uh, is a little bit stronger than someone like Chicago is, is just this, this uh, community element, you know, of like, like, you know, like we, like Surfrider Foundation, like, you know, I like, I, I know and, and I and feel like I have a personal connection with like, you know, Ruff and Stewart there, you know, and like, which like in Chicago, if it was like organization to organization like that, it might be a little bit more formal, mm -hmm. you know, and like, and yeah, and just that, uh, just the level of kind of, uh, you know, ease of access to, to different community members and, and organizations and, and being able to, to connect with them, you know, mm -hmm. on a, almost get to know, get to be, be closer to them without like, you know, as much of a, a courtship, if you will, to, mm -hmm. to get to that point. Um, so that's one thing I think definitely we have, you know, really going for us here. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise though, I'd say, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a kind of a, a different personality. If like organizing is like a person, you know, like Chicago the organizer and Hawaii the organizer, like very different personalities overall beyond like just what is like quote unquote weak or strong. Um, and I think um, here, you know, we, yeah, we definitely have a little bit more of a, um, I don't know, we do, I think, embody that a lot of spirit a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, the Chicago, I think Chicago people get a little bit more in your face, mm -hmm. you know, and, and are, yeah, are more prone to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, and I think definitely between those two communities, you know, I think both can learn from each other, you know. And, uh, um, but yeah, overall, if I had to say one thing in terms of like a, a thing I really love about like the organizing community here and one thing that I think we could do much better at, uh, start with the one thing that I think we do well, um, is, you know, really, um, yeah, kind of support each other and be a community, you know, as, as, uh, as activists, organizers, and so forth. Um, and something I think we could do better is um, just ha be able to have more resources available to especially, you know, specifically actually towards, towards people who are just getting started, you mm -hmm. know? Like luckily, you know, I had a, a lot of access to training and, um, and just opportunities to just hone my craft in Chicago, you know, mm -hmm. like there was just very readily available compared to here. But, you know, I just think if I had to start you know, if I never, if I just started from here, you know, I'd, I think it would be a lot tougher to be able to really um, build up find the skills. The, and yeah, and just find the, the access yeah. to be able to just get educated at the mm -hmm. least, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and then that's actually something uh, we're working on at, at Sierra Club to, mm -hmm. to kind of create a, a more um, kind of formalized and like not just one workshop every so, f so many months or so, but like mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, yeah, something like a, a, a standing service mm -hmm. to be able to help train uh, you know, people to get involved. Yeah. That's really wonderful. So, landlord, I hear that you have a plan yeah. to go to Washington, D.C. Yeah. And then you have a plan to travel all over the country. Yeah. And you have a couple of goals in mind as you do this. So, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about that dream that you, you know, how this this all get started and uh, yeah. okay sure so yeah um, just for a little bit of context in terms of how these decisions were made you know um, yeah I, I'm sure you know everybody knows about the the fire that happened at the Marco Polo building um, 
you know, down, down in, uh, um, you know, Kapilani in Eisenberg, uh, and, um, and I'm a resident of that building, and uh, so, you know, I, I was, yeah, I, I basically since Friday, I've, I haven't been, you know, ha able to sleep there and be there, um, you know, so I've had, in so many ways, been a little bit displaced, you know, I, I don't want to even try to, like, uh, say that I'm experiencing even one percent of like what somebody who is actually houseless, you know, uh, has to experience. But certainly put things a lot of a lot of things into perspective, and really made me, yeah, it really just kind of made me think. Because I don't certainly consider myself a materialistic person, but after that event happened and realizing, oh, shoot, I'm not going to be able to go back home for who knows. I mean, at this point, we don't still know because the inspectors have to let us know when it's officially safe. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of all the smoke damage and the you know the I health hazards also. so we, we I don't know when I'll be able to return um, and yeah it just it did make me kind of think like well on the materialism part right you know like that was a thought that did run through my head immediately it was like oh like my stuff like you know and like what stuff do I need you know almost that you know it's like that question right it's like if you only had could choose if you only fill a backpack and you had to exit a build, burning building what would you put in there mm -hmm. um, and actually, here, here's, here's basically what I did bring. I brought, well, I brought my computer. You brought your computer. I brought, so um, sorry, go ahead. Is this your life now? In your this backpack? is my life. And then there's one yeah. other thing. I brought my keyboard. Um, uh -huh. And that, that is at a friend's house right now okay. that I'm staying with. But otherwise, this is my life. And yeah, and uh, some clothes I shoved in. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. computer, a notebook, a, notebook. Um, uh, a Printed copy of the Tao Te Ching, which okay. is, I would say my, you know, if if I felt like the Tao Te Ching uh, asked for a religion to be created, that would be my religion. But it, I, from my interpretation, it doesn't. You know, it's just like, hey, if you find this stuff useful and like you agree with it's it, it's your cool. inspiration. It is my inspiration. Yeah, inspiration. yeah. So I, it's it's my it's a philosophy that I really uh -huh. rely on. You know, and, and find truth in. Um, otherwise, computer charges and so forth, toiletries. Um, brought my water Water. bottle, yeah. brought a, a coffee, because this is, yeah, you know, it's, it is a luxury, but at this point, don't want to have this be forever, but it is a necessity for me at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, I brought, oh yeah, hard drives. Hard drives, yeah. And then finally, I brought a, uh, a <laughs> banana case, or a banana phone, without a phone in it. But, and it's actually only designed, if you guys can see, it's designed only for a Nokia, like the 1995 Nokia brick phones. Yeah, the ones, yes. And, um... You gotta keep a sense of humor. Sure, and yeah. And we have context about the banana. Do you want to tell our viewers how the banana was such a big item in our community a couple of months ago during legislative session? Well, I think it'd actually be more interesting for you to tell our viewers since yeah let, as, as a third person you know it's what true. do you think yeah you can you how about you can summarize I will cover that uh, in more depth uh, at the second part of the show okay. but the vanilla to me was really wonderful was to really see a way to call attention to the community about um, a very special important bill that would uh, uh, help us come out with the f uh, footprint uh, and the goals to be energy efficient and uh, green by 2045 and that at the very last hours the bill was killed and not because there was not enough support or because it didn't make sense but because of all the political um, issues and uh, the participants and the lobbyists that did not want to see that going forward. So uh, one of the things that I loved about this banana was to see Jeff Kim is my hero, you know, as an organizer saying, let's call the senators and our representatives using the banana, you know, saying, look, it makes sense, you know, to support this. And I think it took off uh, and got a good laugh out of people and a lot of good questions to a good way to get people engaged into really rethinking uh, and reflecting you know why are we not doing this and what can we do to get involved so we're gonna take a quick break sure. and uh, we'll be right back okay <laughs>
Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. And this is your host, Beatrice Kantaman, and we're back with uh, Jeff Kim. So, Jeff, you've been living off of your backpack, and uh, so you mentioned a couple of other items that you have that you did not show <laughs> our viewers. Okay. Uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, what else is in there, that your bare necessities? Okay, sure. So <laughs> I guess, yeah, just to recap, we've got my laptop, Got some hard drives. I got a, another one in the backpack, water bottle, coffee mug, um, just a notebook for like scratch paper and such, um, copy of the Dao De Jing that I just printed out, and uh, computer chargers. I won't bring those yeah. out. You know, a toothbrush and <laughs> toothpaste. <laughs> Show that for our viewers. There you go. Uh, he got you know, sensitive teeth. <laughs> big razor. Um, actually, no, that's, what, that's like a CVS razor. Okay, okay. It's not the right, it's, I, I want to get the branding right. Um, and then, let's see what else I got in here. Um, got a wallet. Um, and you got some money and some credit cards in your well, wallet. Yeah, headphones, these are yes. actually quite essential. And uh, keys, and I was only able to find, this one actually was very high on my list. I only found one, but Earplug. Better than better than none. Uh, one ear plug. Um, it just yeah, it really helps me focus. Uh, and that's about it. And then I grab my keyboard in uh, sure. my keyboard case. And, yeah. and so, from the perspective of the American dream, mm -hmm. where it means different things for different people. Yeah. But we always talk about uh, not it just being material goods. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I mean, you're living, you know, quite a disruption in your life in terms of being displaced uh, since Friday. So the question I have for you is, are you living the American dream? Oh, that's that's a good one. I didn't think you were going to ask me that. Um, oh, well, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Surprise. <touché. laughs> uh, am I living the American dream? Well, I guess we'd have to define it first, right? Or I'd, I'd have to define it at least for my What does that mean to you? Yeah, what does yes. it mean to me? Well, yeah, so, you know, like, that, that is kind of what I said I wanted the general sort of topic to be about, right, today. Um, and, yeah, and I'm still, I'm still figuring it out for myself, honestly. But that's, that is part of, like, you know, why I am pursuing this road trip, if you will. Um, it is certainly one thing is at least bare necessities. You know, it's like... Right at like one point in history, it was like, oh yeah, it's like um, you know, a house, a car, whatever, white picket fence, two point five kids or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and it's like at the very least now that I've experienced, you know, just a small taste of what it's like to be, you know, displaced from your home. Um, certainly, yeah, it it's <laughs> being able to have housing, you know, mm -hmm. at the very least, food, water, shelter. Mm -hmm. At the very least, mm -hmm. is a, requir a baseline requirement for the American dream, mm -hmm. and um, but for me, I guess you know overall, like this much, I do feel confident in saying is that like because uh, I did do a little bit of like sort of reflecting before the program in terms of answering that question of like what is the American dream to me, and like you know I feel like now that we live in a time in the age of climate change, if you will, you know, whereas. Um, yeah, I really, you know, global warming. So I really do believe that, um, you know, without saying that, obviously everybody's different, but at the same time, everybody's the same in terms of like, on a very general sense, I feel, yeah, we all do want the same things. We all want to not have to worry about food, water, and shelter at the very least, right? And then, otherwise, really simple, just be able to have the freedom and access to doing what you love as mm -hmm. all as long as you can do it you know and opportunities opportunities right, yeah yes. and and not just like oh i want this job or that job you mm -hmm. know but like really because you know most just for a little bit of context most of my life before i got into like um community organizing and, and advocacy work was uh was i i just wanted to be you know just wanted to be be 
selling a lot of records as a musician, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, and you know, and, and definitely, like, as an artist, you know, I, I really, that is certainly, for me and a lot of my, my friends who are in the arts community, you know, like, our goal was, like, we just, we want, almost at the end of the day, we want freedom, you know, mm -hmm. to say what we want, to create what we want, mm -hmm. you know, and to, like, and to be able to spend our time doing those things without worrying about, you know, economic, um, you know, struggle or anything like that. About because, like, you know, like a lot of people, a lot of my friends who are like musicians, had to like wait, work some waiting job or something they don't want to do for, you know, forty plus hours a week, and then they can actually do what they really want. You know, and I think mm -hmm. that storyline can apply to all sorts of people and all sorts of different stories. You know, mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Yeah. So at this point, I'm more almost defining what my American dream is by almost almost by more than more needs at first and then also especially given you know a lot of sort of tumultuous political times we're having like almost what we don't want the American mm -hmm. dream to be mm -hmm. you know like because Kanye Westland you know it's like everything I am everything I'm not made me everything I am you know so I'm kind of starting with that almost yeah it's like at least at least let me figure out what I don't want you know um, but to finish off with the global perspective, the global warming part, right? And I say global specifically because, yeah, at, th at this point, it's like, you know, almost to say American dream is irrelevant at this point because, you know, like, yeah, we are facing a global crisis, you know? And I think this is a great opportunity to really think as a global community and kind of think beyond nations, think beyond, you know, ethnicity, think beyond all these kind of ideological barriers that we have mm -hmm. in our heads sometimes, you know? So American Dream in many ways was coined uh, during Depression times yeah. uh, by a lot of immigrants actually that came here uh, who did not have that freedom and the opportunities and the ways you know, to create a society or to thrive in a society where equality and uh, that lack of fear and the opportunity to choose uh, not an issue and so here we are in 2017 and uh, we are expanding that American dream or at least having the opportunity to revise it so so your American dream is kind of undergoing some sabbatical and reflection and yeah. you're going to open up living document if you to will, yeah. you know starting DC why DC you're going to Washington DC yeah okay so so, yeah, to talk a little bit about that. So, I was going to go to Washington, D.C. anyway because, um, you know, I got nominated to go to this um, candidate training put on the, uh, by the PCCC, which stands for uh, Progressive Committee for, or Progressive Campaign Committee for Change or something like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, in the mean, you know, and then also this, this kind of incident with the, the Marco Polo fire happened and, in combination of all these things, you know, I thought, you know what, like, yeah, um, maybe I'll take this opportunity to sort of continue along this life of displacement, if you will, and take it to almost the next level. And, and so I'm going to take a one-way flight to DC, actually. Um, part of that is because, you know, like, because of all this sort of tumult and, and kind of rearranging I've had to do from being, you know, living in the Marco Polo and, and having to figure other stuff out, like, haven't had a lot of time to be able to really um, put together, like, a, a fund me camp, go fund me campaign or something. So I figure, you know, round trip ticket, $1,000, that's kind of a lot to ask in a short amount of time. But 500 maybe, that's, at least that's better, right? Mm -hmm. That's at least half of what that is, so more achievable. And, uh, but also, though, I do want to be able to challenge myself and basically, you know, if I am going to be a political candidate, one of the biggest parts of being a political candidate, you know, I love it or hate it, is going to be fundraising, you know? And so what better lesson to learn how to fundraise than to start with zero and see if I can get back to Hawaii with that. And I plan to use zero money, and there's a, um, uh, a like a little blog that this guy started and he called it Trade Up for a Red Paperclip. So what he did was, he just had this idea. He's like, you know what, I got this red paperclip in my hand. Um, let's see what I can trade for it and how far I can go with trading up for it. So, you know, 
just to start out, he's just like, hey, like, ask somebody, he's like, hey, I got this red paper clip, you want to trade something for it? And some guy's like, uh, okay, I got this pen that looks like a fish, like, you want that? And he's like, okay, cool. Traded that, and then he kept trading and kept trading. Within about 16 trades, he got a house. Um, and that's pretty remarkable to me. That just, this, so yeah. how do you hope uh, to use this experience and then translate that into becoming a political candidate? Like I'm seeing an aspiration, you're yeah, yeah. aspiring to be a politician someday. Well, we'll see, yeah. I mean, it's not uh, an official official, which you're still which is sort part of, of the... flirting with the idea, trying yeah, to yeah, yeah. figure out if this is really your calling. Right, right. But th which is part of why I want to go to the training mm -hmm. to really mm -hmm be able to answer a lot of the questions that I do have. That so would, yeah. what are the questions that you have for yourself right now as far as in this new revised American dream that you're trying to sort out for your life moving forward and in the context of maybe a career shift where you may or you may not choose to be a, a political figure, you know, either as a candidate or behind the scenes, what are the things that you uh, are still evaluating, you know, in this journey? Um, you mean on, on the journey towards, like, defining the American dream for myself? Or? Uh, well, that is, I think you're going to find out as you go through. Sure. But that part of whether you choose to become uh, uh, involved, yeah. uh, you know, in the political arena or not. Uh, Oh, so what are some questions that I still have to yes. answer to be able to do that? I guess pretty just simple questions, just, um, you know, figuring out where, if, if that is, because all I care to do with my life is just be as effective towards, um, you know, specifically addressing the climate crisis as possible, but overall in terms of just solving problems. You know, I think that's really what an a activist advocate is, you know, and is a person, a problem solver, mm -hmm. or somebody who at least seeks out to do so, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so yeah, I just, wh however I best I can be utilized is what I want. So that's kind of part of, that's the main question, really. That's mm -hmm. the operative question mm -hmm. in terms of answering that for me. And there's a lot of uh, different avenues I know I could take that, that I think, I, at this point, I see as being simil you know, similarly effective. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's really what's, what's the question. And by the way, just in case we run out of time, this is going to be the item that I'm going to trade up for. So hopefully this will manifest into a, a plane ticket from California to Hawaii in the near future. That was it. Well, on that note, I can't believe how quickly our show came to an end. But I okay. would love to see you when you come back from D.C. Yeah. Or maybe even when well, you are California. in your... When yeah. you are, you know, on your way back, uh, we can connect via Skype. I want to hear, you know, how things are going with your journey. Great. And uh, I know that no matter where you end up professionally, that you are an amazing servant leader. Oh, thank you. And that is one of the biggest characteristics that I see uh, that is important, not only for politicians nowadays, but moving forward, uh, but also towards rebuilding of our American dream, whatever that means for each one of us mm -hmm. uh, in, in this country and, and beyond. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, this concludes our program for today. And I look forward to seeing you again next Friday. And uh, so until next Friday, and uh, we hope.